Hello, welcome to episode 15 of the Crownsman Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Downey, and beside me is my lovely co-host, Gaudi Molina. How are you today? Good morning. I'm very good, thank you. Good morning. Someone might be watching this in the afternoon, Gaudi. <laughs> yeah, but it's my morning. <laughs> That's true. Early <laughs> morning this morning, with snow. Well, it was kind of snowing. It hasn't, it's not really snowing. I wish it was. A West Coast snow. A West Coast snow, exactly. <laughs> well, I saw Gowdy uh, walking. I was in early this morning, and I saw Gowdy when you were coming into the office. I saw <laughs> you were just like, I couldn't even see your face. I don't even know like how you knew. Eskimo. Yeah, I don't <laughs> even know how you knew where you were going. <laughs> but anyway, you made it across the street. Um, we have as a guest today. Yes. Gowdy. So this is episode 15. Yeah. And we have Brad Kindle from Ashdown Capital. He's actually the founder of Ashdown Capital. Um, But I will let Brad kind of continue a little bit to tell us a little bit more about himself. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. It's uh, honestly, it's an honor with all the guests you've had on in the last few months here to to have me on. It's that's real cool. So yeah, Brad Kendall with Ashdown Capital. Uh, I founded the company a couple years ago and I've got a business partner, Ryan Turner, um, that uh, helps run the show with me there. We're a commercial loan brokerage, so we help businesses get financing. Mm-hmm. Um, deals we rain, you know, things we're doing anywhere from, you know, helping a developer buy land or construct a project, all the way to helping businesses, you know, get working capital themselves, buy buildings to operate from, all sorts of things. Any anything that uh, has to do with a business looking for money, you know, we're the ones to to call to help them out and find it. Right. We um. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of, you know, we have had engineers, business developers, CEOs on the show, all in like, mining, agriculture, heavy industry. And, but I think at the, for any company, the financing is such a key part. And so we, we knew, um, we knew we had to get into that because you could get the best advice in the world if you can't get it financed one way or the other, um, it's like projects of any kind is likely not going to go ahead. Um, so, yeah, thanks for coming, joining the show, and, and kind of walking us through some of these, uh, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities, how it actually all works. Um, I want to just, just kick off by uh, asking you, what's, um, what's one of the big deals that you've, you've done? Um, just something that's, you know, just one of the, the large things that maybe took some time to put together, but it, it actually was able to, you were able to facilitate it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it feels like every deal takes forever to put together. Mm. You know, things move slow, you know, in the financing world uh, for the most part. But uh, I'd say, you know, we, I'd categorize it in a couple different things. So we've done some really large development projects. Um, you know, we've done projects that are financing projects that are eight phases that are completed over, you know, four or five years or, mm-hmm. or even longer. And and the financing amount, you know, the total project amount, you know, in the hundreds of millions. Um, and then we've helped, you know, businesses that are, you know, their full banking package, whether it's lines of credits, uh, uh, you know, equipment financing, uh, building stuff. We've helped a couple businesses, one business in particular uh, in the transportation industry. We helped them kind of recalibrate, restructure, and kind of take care of everything that they've got across Western Canada that, you know, that transaction was in, the, you know, around 30 million bucks. Um, which, you know, again, a combination of a little bit of a operating line, working capital type stuff, some equipment finance for the trailers, trucks, that kind of thing, and then land and, uh, and space to, to operate from. So, yeah, we, we get involved in projects, you know, large to small. The, the, the larger ones are always the sexy, fun ones to talk mm-hmm. about. But, yeah. um, you know, the, the mid-size one is, is, you know, really the, the most common that we see in the industry. Um, but, yeah, we've do certainly done some, some cool, sexy large ones is it so on a, a project like that where you've got land equipment working capital are they coming to you with a pretty clear idea or do you have to sort of build the story for them in that in, in something like that with so many moving parts yeah so uh, it varies we might get a, somebody that comes in and specifically says hey we want to finance this land or we want to finance this project and every little piece of financing is done differently the banks look at it differently mm-hmm. you know depending on the risks and depending on you know what they're looking for and a lot of the times you know they might come to us with something you know we're looking for we want to finance this and we end up finding a better way to structure it because different types of debt are are priced differently equipment Mm -hmm. financing is is traditionally more expensive than land financing and construction financing than you know a uh, long-term you know mortgage or whatnot for a commercial space so we will yeah take 
their need and then often it means restructuring what they think they need to make it really work best for them and for the bank or, or the lender and and, uh, and then pushing it forward that way you know with their collaboration do you have any strange ones like have you done a couple <laughs> products where you're just like that it may be it, it's worth financing but you when you first hear what are you going really oh yeah we get we get we, we almost call those the kind of the cool deals right we yeah. get you know we can go finance some brick and mortar and you know we like doing those. those are, those are kind of the easier ones for the most part. But yeah, we get a lot of kind of weird stuff. I'd say the strangest thing we never ended up doing it, but it's something funny. Just thing it's maybe funny is we got th you know through our, our website we had a guy call us in and said that he had a, a collection of you know Rolexes and watches that he wanted to f leverage up and <laughs> finance so he could put some money into his business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we're not a pawn shop, I guess, but yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we have funny stuff like that. But you know, we've done. Uh, we, we've seen stuff as weird financed as, you know, back in the Bitcoin craze days where oh people yeah. were financing those Bitcoin mining machines. Yeah. Um, one of our guys, you know, was working on a deal for uh, a dairy farm, you know, automated dairy equipment, you know, cattle, mm -hmm. uh, milking equipment. There, there's a lot of kind of stuff to me that seems strange that, you know, in that specific industry, it's, you know, it's the norm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything gets financed. You know, you look around, there's... There's a lot of really good healthy companies out there, and 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 the majority of businesses borrow, even the healthy ones, right? Yeah. Especially in today's low interest environment, where it's cheap to get access to capital. You know, margins, margins in business. You know, traditionally, bottom line margins can range, you know, six to seven percent up to thirty, forty, fifty percent for some of the really really good high margin businesses. And and with capital, you know, being between you know four and five percent, kind of on average right now, um, and a lot of the times. You know, you're turning that capital three, four, or five times in a year. Some of these businesses, so mm -hmm. it makes sense to borrow if if you've got the the ability to grow with it, right? We're we're uh, people that were trying to uh, get the the Bitcoin, uh, I guess c computers, the mining machines, in a sense. What um, were they able to get financing for that? Yeah, it's. I mean, we haven't done anything like that recently. At, at that time, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, when it was the craze and Bitcoin mm -hmm. was worth a ton of money and there was a lot, lot going on. It, it, I mean, that's high risk stuff. It's kind of private offshoot lenders. Oh, that I are see. To that, that, towards that, it's, you know, banks don't get involved in, in that kind of thing. You know, with all the anti money laundering rules and all that kind of stuff, they, they, they're pretty careful to steer yeah, clear of any, anything I'm that's uncertain so. like yeah. that. But, but yeah, there, there are lenders. I mean, I don't want to say there's lenders out there that will finance anything, but. You know, if, if there's a deal that makes sense and there's a business case to be had and, you know, traditionally if, if a business owner is coming to us, you know, they, they've thought it through, they've planned it out, they think they can make money on it, traditionally, pardon me, there's going to be somebody on the other side that is, is willing to lend the money. That right? agrees uh, with what they've already come you know, to the conclusion, yeah. There's always a, there's a price that people will pay. I mean, it, it, somebody comes in and says, oh, you know. <laughs> to go bit mining, you know, we, we don't have to talk about Bitcoin the whole time. I'm not an expert in Bitcoin, <laughs> what do you mean? But somebody comes in and talks about looking to do Bitcoin, and yeah. you know, the lender is going to say, "Well, for me to be comfortable with this, with the fluctuations in Bitcoin, you know, if I'm going to give you, you know, whatever fifty thousand dollars for this machine, I need to be paid back in the next year mm -hmm. because I don't know what's going to happen to the fluctuation of Bitcoin, and you know, and this and that, mm -hmm. and then, you know, to compensate for the risk that I'm taking on, I need fifteen percent or twenty percent or thirty percent, and whatever." the lenders are willing to do, especially if you're going into that kind of private lending world, um, <coughs> eventually the rate might become too high where for the business owner it doesn't make sense to do it anymore, right. in which case a deal doesn't happen, right? Right. Uh, in which case the business owner needs to kind of start maybe retweak their idea or figure out the plan a little bit more to, to make it less risky or what have you, right? But, yeah, ultimately, I mean, we have we see a lot of cool stuff to get finance. Uh, that's the honestly the best part of what we do. You know, we we get to go even from a, r a young age when I originally got into banking. You know, being being young and being able to go into sit down with a CEO and have a candid conversation like you do on the show. Mm -hmm. You know, in their office and, and learn about their business and see you know hear about their story, how they started the business, you know, how they got it to today, what challenges they had, what you know, what were the aha moments that really you know, turn the corner, all that kind of stuff, and, and truly learn about the businesses. And it, and it is amazing, you know, you all see it driving around. Driving around. I always I always say when you're driving around, you know, when you're trying to think of a paint color for your house, you notice the color of every, yeah. every everyone's house, right? You're looking at everyone's house. Yeah, when or you're the not type thinking, of car you drive. Right, yeah. you're just looking to buy a new car. Exactly, right? But when you're not in it, you don't think about that. So in my business, we deal with business owners all day long. I, I drive around and every industrial park I see, I see, well, what's that business? Oh, what mm -hmm. do they do? It just, it intrigues me, right? 
and to go in and have the opportunity to sit in some of these businesses on a daily basis and, and really learn what they do. And it's, it's unbelievable. Like on the West Coast, the, the type of businesses that we have in our backyard that are supplying products you wouldn't even think about all over the world or, or locally or through Canada, the state, every, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool, right? Yeah. yeah. I've been to some, uh, like we went to a trade show in, uh, in Vegas. That was a, was it a construction it was for, yeah, it was a construction show in Vegas. Huge, huge show. And so they had, I mean, all the, uh, all these OEM companies were there. So they're, I mean, they're selling the button that goes in the, the cat machine, right? Like it's just, and it's, and there's some of them are like milli, multi million, even up to the billion dollar businesses. And it's just, y you just hit that button every time. You yeah. don't think, no, there's actually a company that just makes this little button. To spec for the company, they ship them all over the world to yeah. the, the manufacturers. And their buttons better than their competitors for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah, or yeah. it's two percent cheaper. It's cool, or right? yeah. <laughs> Actually, I want to go back to the. You mentioned the uh, the the automated milk machines. <laughs> so was that new to you or new to the industry? That would be new to me. I mean, oh, you know the. I don't know. I'm not a, f a farming expert. We've got a guy Brian Redekop out out in the valley that works with us. That uh, he'd he'd know better how long ago that you know technology was introduced but that was something that when i saw you know a deal like that that was new and cool to me i mean that yeah. industry um and, and a big part of why we brought you know brian onto our team is because he's a he's a true expert in that field and uh, we're not myself mm -hmm. and my partner ryan you know we don't have a whole lot of experience in, in financing egg products land you know lag uh, quotas all that kind of stuff where, where brian does um, but I, from what I gather, I, I think that technology has been around for a while. I, I'm sure it's everly, you know, always improving and getting better and yeah. and whatnot. I mean, I've, I've heard it, you know, and, uh, there's probably might be people watching that would know probably more than me. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I've heard it's more like a, it's like an assembly line. They line up and they, they get, they get milked. And if they don't have milk, <laughs> the machine somehow senses that they don't. And they, they get, sl you know, slapped off and, <laughs> on and <laughs> get back in line half an hour later or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. yeah we're going to get some calls. Yeah. We're going to get that some calls. That paints a picture. <laughs> we're going to get some calls about that technology. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, really? that's good. <laughs> um, that is not how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, right? Um, what I'm, what I was getting at though is if that, when you're going to a bank with, let's say it's, you know, automated milking machines or it's uh, in the logging industry, an automated machine for loading logs or yeah. whatever it is. If it's a new technology, how do you, when you go to the bank to get that financed, are they going to look at, and I'm, sh I'm sure the answer is there's multiple things they're going to look at. But if it's a new technology and it's an established company, how comfortable will the bank be financing something that's new to the industry but the, if the company's not new i mean i know if it's just a new company yeah, they got something it, you know they don't have cash flow in that it's kind of eliminates Change them. the story yeah but, but if it's new technology yeah so so again there's a wide range of lenders right so we our primary lending source we start with the banks and, and the credit unions and the traditional lending source because they're they're the cheapest right yeah um so in speaking of you know to those lenders really any lender but a deal like that where it's an existing strong business that's growing and has good cash flow and they're 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 taking on a new piece of equipment whether mm. you know whether it's new to them or just new to the industry or, or revolutionary anything banks are going to be all over that they love that kind of stuff i mean yeah. if it's innovative and it's going to show uh, you know they'll ask the questions and that's part of what we do is really tell the story mm -hmm. on you know by buying this piece of equipment it's going to change their margins because they're going to be able to do, be this much more efficient or they're going to be able to take on these projects they otherwise wouldn't have or it's going to save them this much more time or, or what have you and kind of paint the story of what that's going to do, how that's even going to improve their cash flow going mm -hmm. forward, right? So certainly b banks love that kind of stuff. They, the traditional banks, the most important thing to them is cash flow. Uh, you know, a lot of people think the most important is security, right? Um, security is important, don't get me wrong. Banks, mm -hmm. you know, banks are not in the business of losing money, right? They're, they're, a, they're a unique function that's there where they have money and they lend it out with the mm -hmm. expectation of 100% getting it back at a very, very thin margin, right? Right. Um, so security is important, but cash flow is everything. If, you know, banks will lend unsecured if there's good cash flow, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, that, that's a testament to it. So certainly if, if there's a, if there's a, a business that's growing, um, that's doing something, you know, more innovative that has good cash flow and, and needs capital to, to make that investment in their business, then you know banks are traditionally all over it. On the on the other scale, you know if you have cash flow, you, you're going to be financing at the low rates with the best bankers. You'll have you know people bidding all over the place. 
if it's something opposite where say uh, kind of in the in the middle end like still a still a really good business um, but maybe they're not doing as well as some of their competitors or maybe they're not doing as well as they'd like to be doing but by buying this piece of equipment whether it's new and innovative or just something different that they're bringing to their organization mm -hmm. if we can still make the case and show that by bringing that new piece of equipment to their business if they had a, had it a year ago this mm. is what would have happened last year in their financial statements and make normalizations to say, you know, if they had done this a year ago, they, you know, then this is what would have happened. And therefore, by bringing it in this year, this is what's going to happen from it. These are the synergies. These are the things that are going to improve it and make it better, right? A and those deals can still fall to a really good traditional lender at, at good low rates, right? Right. There are lenders all along the scale where, you know, they there's pretty well pure asset lenders that'll just look at an asset and say, you know what, I don't want to ask too many questions. I don't want to take too much time. I'll fund next week type of thing. Right. Uh, you know, and we're going to fund purely on that asset and mm. we'll do it at a low leverage and uh, low loan to value of the asset and, and, and go from that for sure. But yeah, the, the, the good businesses with cash flow, hundred percent. It's, I always say those are the businesses the banks want to borrow to. They would throw money at businesses like that all day long. You know, traditionally to become that business, a lot of the business owners grew to that stage because they're very conservative with capital and they're, right. you know, they make every educated decision and, and, you know, and, and traditionally, um, you know, th that's how they get there. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the banks love that kind of stuff. I guess that leads probably a, you probably answered the question then how, how quickly can you tell if someone walks in in and they're, they're wanting, they're wanting to raise cap, they're wanting to something finance. How quickly can you tell if yeah, this is not worth, worth pursuing? Generally? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, every deal is different, right? Yeah. Um, and, it, and it depends on the story. Like our, our, our business is all about understanding the story, sitting with the, with the business owner and truly getting a good idea. I mean, I can depict a really, really good deal from a really bad deal in seconds, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, you know, I can tell you, I can tell a business, you know, in, you know, within an hour, certainly, you know, an hour conversation and, 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 you know, having some time looking at financial statements and understanding the story and what the purpose of the financing is, you know, certainly wi within an hour for, I'd say, pretty well most, uh, most deals. But mm -hmm. sometimes it takes a long time. It's, it's those, those ones that are right on the brink of it's not a slam dunk. They're not the guys being chased by the banks. They're kind of at a tipping point in their business. Maybe they're growing like crazy and they've, you know, given up some margins in the last few years to, yeah. to reinvest in growth and all these different types of things, you know, whether it's personnel, bringing on new personnel or new equipment or what have you, and really understanding that story. And, and, and then those are the ones where it takes a lot of our time to, to normalize the financial statements, right? Take, take the, the banks, unfortunately, they, they look more so on historics, right? Mm. Uh, business owners, you know, myself, a business owner, what happened last year's that's past You're, we're yeah, moving on right yeah, we're thinking absolutely. about next year we've hired a couple of people we're thinking about what's going to go on next year and you know yeah. that's the we we live in the future and, and and now right whereas you know banks they they look at the future and they certainly look at projections and that kind of thing um and the quality of management and being able to to rely on that but th they rely mostly most heavily on on historics right so a big part of what we do for for deals that are like kind of on that brink is looking at the historics and then understanding what the future is going to look like and then seeing if there's any real good case we can make to normalize and adjust those historical financials based on, you know, whatever activities are happening today, right? Yeah. Um, by, uh, you know, I rambled there a bunch there, but uh, you know, traditionally I'd say how long does it take, you know, two to three hours from when we get all the information that we request. We can, we have a really good idea of what, where it's going to fall on, you know, the traditional lenders to a, a second lender, to an equity lender, to the deals not happening at all. Yeah. Um, for sure within a few hours, as long as we've got all the right information. Yeah. You know, so we've been, you know, we, we're not gonna be able to dial it down every time that this is where it's gonna go and this is the rate exactly, yeah. you know, within three hours, you know, you do some research independently, but we've been surprised too, where we get a little bit of information and then we present to a client, hey, this is this is where we think it's gonna go, this is where we're gonna go, and then they say, oh, and we also got this, and we go, oh, well, that changes it. Oh, yeah. Now we can, this is gonna change this, is, you know, so it is really important to get you know, all the information, right? Yeah. I mean, that's maybe going off topic a little bit here, but you know, that that's a, a big piece when, when people are going to the banks, you know, I, it's the banks need all the information, you know, yeah. so many times we are dealing with people that were, they want to hide something negative that happened to them, right? Something bad that happened to their business last year where there was a, a bad debt or they had, you know, a project that went south or something like that. Yeah. And they want to hide it. And 
the banks are smart. They f they f they're going to find it out, right? You know, it's our job is to get ahead of that. Let, let's let's put it right on the table and figure out why that happened. And, and as a business owner, what have you done to make sure that something like that's not going to happen again? And and maybe we normalize that again out of the statements and make you know present the case that it was a one off and it was you know something a mistake that we made or something that was out of our control or, or what have you, right? Yeah. And that stuff really does make a difference Huge. to the bank. Yeah. yeah. Huge, right? Do you ever find that, um, or have had customers or clients that uh, find it hard to f find all all the pieces that you require to look at? Yeah. So most of the time, business don't businesses businesses don't struggle to get us all the information they need. But a lot of the times, we're asking for stuff, and they're going, "Well, well what do you need that for? We didn't mm. think we need that." They they struggle knowing what all the information it is, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's a that's a big piece of why you know, why we're able to be in business. We all came from the banks. All, all the guys working with us at Ashdown, we're all ex, you know, corporate bankers. And we've all sat on the other side of the desk, you know, underwriting a deal and working it through the credit system of the bank and the pricing systems of the bank. So we truly have a really good understanding for what the bank is going to look for in order to ultimately approve the deal or approve that pricing exception or, or, or anything of that nature, right? So that, for sure, it's a lot of the times we'll ask, you know, oh, can you get this? Can you bring us this? And they're saying, well, what do you need that for? And, you know, we explain it through and they go, oh, of course, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, you know, I'd say the most common thing that uh, that businesses don't have access to when, we, um, when we're asking for it, which, which I find a little bit surprising sometimes, is, is projections for the following year and budgets for the following year. Mm. Um, I think it's a really good exercise for a bank or for a business, not only because a bank would require it, but just for your own... Um, running the business and being able to kind of give yourself, it's almost like a goal, right? What are we going to try to do this year? Based on the adjustments we've made since last year, what are we going to try to do from a revenue perspective? Where are our margins going to fall based on, you know, the contracts and or, or what have you that we've got going on? And putting together, you know, prior to the start of the year, what do we think next year is going to look like and potentially the year after and, you know, maybe even up to five years. Some of the really good businesses that we're working with, they've projected out five years on where they think the business is going to go and they've got these, you know, cool models, whether their accountants are putting them together for them or somebody in-house that, that they can adjust as contracts come in and whatnot, right? So that would be something that's that's more common. Um, and it's, if, especially if you're going to be going to a bank looking for financing because you're going to be growing, mm -hmm. the banks really want to see what impact that's going to have on your results, right? And if the bank is asking that question, hey, provide us some financial statements for what 2020 is going to look like, 2021, you know, years, year or one or two in advance, and you don't have it, they're they kind of go on. So you haven't thought about it enough to know what, yeah. you know, what next year is going to look like, but we're expecting to just kind of take your word for it type of thing. Right. So mm -hmm. that would be one thing that we often ask for something else that, um, sometimes, you know, we ask, we'll ask the question about, you know, your personal credit score, right. Um, it's not as important in business, but the banks still weigh it very heavily, uh, in terms of, uh, like character. And, uh, a lot of, a lot of people, I mean, I, I think the, the whole credit score system, in my opinion, is broken. Uh, you know, we won't go off on that topic. Um, but well, we, we might. <laughs> <laughs> Can we t yeah, dot it down? No, fine. But, but, your time. <laughs> but in, my, just in my opinion, the banks still weigh heavily on it, right? And, and in some cases, uh, almost too heavily on some mm. of these things. A lot of, <coughs> a lot of the times, it's, it's, there, there are things that are credit score driven. For a, a large business, it's not something that's going to make or break a deal for sure. A large commercial business, it's not. But... But the banks traditionally do ask for it. And, I, you know, sometimes we'll ask customers or business owners, you know, what's your credit like? And, and they say, well, well yeah, I think it's good. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. No one You're talking about smaller kind of. No, even larger <coughs> businesses. It's, it's shareholders. The, the banks are going to pull it no matter what. Uh, you know, the, if there's any form of personal guarantee involved. If, it's, if we're talking about a business that's doing 100 million plus in revenue and they've got tons of assets and they're low leverage and everything, the, the yeah. personal doesn't. The credit score is not going to matter. They're going to still care about the shareholder and their input on the organization and their management style and all that kind of stuff. But the right. actual credit score, if they have a you know a delinquency for whatever reason, it's not going to matter. Um, but most businesses, especially if it's a business where that shareholder is a key contributor to the business on a daily basis, makes mm -hmm. all the decisions, is a key personnel, mm -hmm. they will pull a credit score just to see what their character's like. You know, if you pull a bureau and it's clean, they know, oh, this guy pays his bills, et cetera. If you pull it and there's 15 different things on it, it'll say something, you know, you know about it, right? In most cases, it's, you know, the bank will pull a score and there might be, you know, one or two things on from a mobility company or, you know, an old, you know, 
something they somebody bought a long time ago or something when they were a child or whatever but and, and it's explainable and, and mitigatable but, but that's another thing that sometimes we ask and, and business owners just aren't aren't aware i mean nowadays um you know there's credit karma and things online you can just pull it for free and it doesn't hit your score or whatever just just to know right yeah. yeah um and i mean i think that's something that's important for not even just for business owners but just people personal if they're ever getting a mortgage and that kind of thing because something like that can just cripple you to the banks right and i've seen so many cases where it's fraud right to to no f- one's fault somebody walks into a, a, a mobility store with your fake id somehow and opens an account and and all of a sudden that's on your bureau and you're fighting it and it shows up and it kills your score. And in the meantime, you're trying to, you know, apply for a loan in some sort and, and you, you get crippled by it. Right. So, I, I mean, that's another thing. It's we're way off topic because it's not a whole lot to do with, you know, a lot of the commercial stuff we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but something. But it does affect these it commercial. Can, yeah, for yeah. Sure. <coughs> something to be aware of. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, <coughs> I kind of wanted to go into. uh where are we at? I just got to find my spot here. Over here. We're having we had a good run here. Sometimes we have to reset once we go through it. No, no, it's all <laughs> good. It's getting hot here, right? Getting fired up. <laughs> fired up about finance, right? Well, Bankers it, and accountants, right? They're the worst. <laughs> they are the <laughs> absolute as worst. As dull as it gets, right? <laughs> but you know what? It's what people think about probably yeah, more than anything else when they're trying to run their business is the financial side. Yeah, it's and a big impact, yeah. And I kind of, well, I mean, we're running a business as well. And um, if watching this show today gives somebody one thing that helps them make an adjustment in their business, uh, you know, planning out the next two or three years, then it's then there's a lot of value. So I, I think people are, and so much of the, the financial information you get. Um, I went in. I was uh, I was looking at a TFSA account the other day. So I went and I talked. To, so and the 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 woman I sat down with, she had awards long on, all on her shelf, and so she started the sales pitch to me. Um, I probably understand them better than a lot of people would. Not as good as as some. And so as soon as I started to ask questions that were legitimate questions. The sales pitch just stopped, and we moved on from it because they were such bad options that right. she was offering. Yeah. So, so much of what the financial information people get is when someone's trying to sell to them, or it's a two-minute promo or a thirty-second promo in between a hockey game. Right. Where are you going to get? You know, most people don't don't have don't do courses in accounting. They don't have the t- opportunity to work for a bank for s- for years. Right. So, where are they going to get that information? So. You know, even the little tangents about the personal stuff, it is helpful to people because they, most people have not really sat in a conversation, and in this case, looking into a conversation and got to hear right. w- what actu- what the conversations are in the financial world until they need the money. Right, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, they need it a month from now, and now they're having the conversation. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've been there before. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, sorry, yeah. uh, and Ashdown services, like, a lot of different areas. Right. Yeah. Um, just because I was looking, and but I wanted to kind of, and I'll just put this on the screen just so people know what I'm looking at. <laughs> um. So, but I want to talk about every uh, every area you kind of uh, service. So, real estate finance, working capital finance, uh, equipment finance, construction and development. Right. Yeah. Those are the kind of main ones you you service. Yeah. Okay. Um. Can you? What I- what are the main differences of each? Like, which one has the biggest challenges that you find? Yeah, so, I mean, they all have their own challenges, right? Every business has a different challenge. I mean, if you're looking to buy a piece of real estate, if you're looking to finance 90% of it versus 75%, there's going to be different challenges, right? Mm. If you're if you're looking to buy it for your business to operate from or to buy it as an investment to rent out to a third party, there's different challenges. And those would be, yeah, the four key areas that, that we work in. And then I would just expand on the, the working capital uh, and add in more uh, included in that would be like cash flow financing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, financing cash flow, whether it's for an acquisition or a management buyout or something true where there is no there's no security necessarily, bes- mm-hmm. you know, behind it. Um, so I guess if, if you want me to kind of ch- jump through each one, uh, sure. let's start yeah. with real estate. Real estate's always a, a hot topic yeah. in uh, – on the west coast here and probably you know throughout canada right now yeah. um so real estate you know i'd break it down into two or th- well really three different things so in real estate there's 
there's construction finance, land acquisition, which we kind of categorize together. And then there's operating finance. So a building, a commercial building that somebody operates from, a business operates from. So, mm. you know, it's, it's the building they run their manufacturing plant through, they store their equipment in, what have you. And then there's uh, an investor owned building. So a building that an investor um, could be a business owner, could be just a peer investor, could be anybody buys uh, and, and leases it out. Right. So they've got third party tenants in there that are occupying the space. And and ultimately, the mortgage on that building is paid for by the rent that's uh, that's accumulated. So in those three areas, uh, it makes a, every one of those makes a huge difference to the bank. Um, mm. So if we start with an owner occupied building, if a business owner is looking to buy an owner occupied piece of real estate, the bank is going to adjudicate. They're going to approve that loan based on the cash flow of the business that's going to operate out of there. Right. Okay. So, the, you know, they'll, if it's a business that was previously renting, then they're going to look at the net income of the business the last year. They're going to add back some non cash items, amortization, and, you know, maybe interest they paid or something like that. And then they're going to add also the rent that they were paying the previous year because they're no longer uh, going to be required to pay that rent once they move into the m- new building. So mm-hmm. they normalize those income statement, that income statement with, and then, offset that against the new mortgage that they're going to pay. So the bank wants to make sure that the operating business that's going to be in there is going to pay that mortgage. Mm. And traditionally, the the banks, uh, you know, I don't want to get too technical, but they get into, they put these res- covenants, they call them financial covenants on the loan, and they say that that business needs to produce enough cash flow to pay for the mortgage and any other debts that they've got by 125%. Mm. So if they, if the total principal and interest payments of the mortgage and any debt they've got is a hundred thousand. Yep. Then they're generally their normalized EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax depreciation, uh, amortization. That normalized amount needs to be one hundred twenty-five thousand. So one hundred twenty-five percent of the hundred grand. Right. And if that's the case, then the next thing they're going to ask for is what kind of leverage are you looking for on that building? Mm. So if it's fifty percent leverage. Banks are going to do it all day, 60%, 70%, 75% leverage. The banks have internal policies that they're always amending Mm. um, depending on their, uh, you know, their global view on, you know, as a bank on the industry that you're buying in, right? If you're buying in a rural town, you might get a lower leverage. If you're buying downtown Vancouver, you might, you know, get a higher leverage. And at the opposite, if they think there's some uncertainty, you might be able to get higher out in a rural area where it doesn't fluctuate so much. Right. Whereas downtown, the banks might be pulling back if they think there's going to be some some corrections, right? So the banks will then assess what leverage they're willing to do. Traditional banks today, anyways, um, beginning of 2019, they're they're traditionally comfortable around that 75% mark. Mm -hmm. Um, We've seen some, some get creative and finding alternative ways that we've done it where they're getting, you know, 80, 85%. And then there's other lenders, you know, like the Business Development Bank of Canada, for instance, um, that will support business owners where they'll actually do leverage upwards of 100%. Really? Um, Again, it all comes down to that cash flow. So obviously, the more leverage you're taking on, the bigger your loan amount is going to be, the more interest you're paying. The higher the leverage that you're using, traditionally, the rate goes up because it's more risky for the bank. Uh, So the higher the leverage, the higher, you know, your debt servicing requirement, the banks call it. Mm -hmm. So the higher EBITDA, net income, that you've got to make in order to qualify for that loan yeah. so that is owner occupied real estate and, and it, it's a it's a really important distinction because um when the banks are looking at financing they are governed by you know depending on the bank or the credit union they're, they're governed by a, a different body um, but say for instance OFSI, OFSI that's uh, regulating the the canadian chartered banks they set out uh, regulations and limits to how much of a bank's balance sheet mm. can be in each respective area Right. So they might come out and say in 2021, uh, don't quote me on this, it's not going to happen. But in 2021, (laughs) we only want 25 percent of a bank's balance sheet to be in investor owned and related uh, real estate. And of course, that's to protect, you know, the consumers and the banks and everybody as a whole, that if there's a crash, they're not overexposed in one area and everything's not going to collapse. Right. So it's obviously a really good thing. Um, But they will do that. So if a bank for instance, is, v- is really, really exposed and they're, they've, they're always at that cap, which, you know, because of the way that the real estate market has gone in Western Canada the, the last number of years, especially, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, they were, s- the banks were so not overexposed, they were within their caps, but they were right up bumping those caps all the time where it, it was tougher for a smaller developer, a smaller investor owned guy to, to get a loan because the bank was so close to their, their cap for investor owned real estate. 
So it's really important to, to understand the distinction because, you, you know, for us especially, but for the bank, we need to know where it's going to fall on the balance sheet. And then identifying on our part which banks have room in their caps, which room, mm-hmm. which ones don't, right? So they classify owner-occupied real estate on the other side because it's paid for by the business, not by an independent investor or third party, whereas construction and um, – and, uh, uh, like a long-term mortgage that's rented out, that's mm-hmm. all all considered to be, you know, investor-owned. Anything speculative. So if you're constructing a building for your own use, that would be owner-occupied. Right. But if you're constructing a, constru- a tower downtown that you're going to sell the units after, they would consider that investor-owned. And, of course, the struggle for some of the smaller, mi- mid-size investors and developers is that, you know, over the years, the banks, of course, they love doing a deal downtown for one of the big you know, seven or eight developers because it's, you know, if you can put 200 million out in one transaction, that's way less admin you got to put to a file compared to doing, you know, a hundred, you know, $2 million transactions, right? They still collect their same fee and, and they love the construction projects because they can fee it up front and they get their money back in 18 months, two right. years, three years, depending on the, on the length of the project. And then they can re- invest, uh, lend it out again. Right. So yeah, it's, it, that's, a, that's an important distinction. So that would be, you know, that the owner occupied, that's how they, you know, traditionally that they do it the banks love that right now because they're you know bumping caps here every dollar that they can lend over here allows them to lend more on that side right and there's a lot of a lot of that coming in and out of the banks right now so they love owner occupied real estate especially for good businesses that can cash flow it so is it ha- does it have to generally be even then or or you're saying it it, it changes yes yeah, so it's it's regulated right so right. they they might come out and say you know we're comfortable at 26% we're comfortable at 25% 27% you know it can change at any given time. I don't know if it's public information. You know, I've heard through the windows of the banks, you know, telling us, oh, we're at our cap at 25, whatever. Um, but yeah, so they'll, the bank will come out or, or the regulators will come out and say like, based on the economy and everything that we, you know, all the information we have at our disposal, we want the banks to only be levered at 25% of their overall books. So if they're doing 10 trillion of loans, we only want two and a half to be in that space, right? Mm. So obviously if you grow in this space, then all of a sudden now you've got 11, so you can you know, you can so you, here, right? oh, okay. So that's why they love they're, they're loving the owner occupied they have over the last few so years. So when they when someone when a developer is going to get a project financed, it's they're not just they're not just trying to find the bank who's willing to. They're actually trying to find a bank who is within their the bank's regulations is allowed to yeah. fund a project yeah, like that. Yeah, for sure. A- and especially you know we over the year it, it's it's changing now because the the, the construction landscape and the investment landscape is, is changing it's cooled down a little bit um but uh yeah it, for a while there and, and even now still you know we'll get a, a really good construction project in it's an experienced developer and mm-hmm. it's a really 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 good project it's low leverage and we'll take it to a bank and and they just go we, we just don't have the room so we go to the next bank oh we don't have the room yeah. you know we go to a credit union they say we just don't have the deposits to, to do it. we don't want the room right and it's sometimes it's magic formula of finding the right bank that has the room. Or multiple, right? Yeah, yeah, or multiple. If it's large enough and, w- and it has mm. to be syndicated between multiple, then for sure. Um, a lot of the times, it's a, there's a banker on the other end going, oh, I love this deal. I'd love to do this deal. Like, we just can't do it right now. We just don't have the cap room or we just don't have the space or, or the appetite for it right now. For a, foreign, for a foreign bank, I don't know if you, you're privy to this, but for a foreign bank that's operating in Canada, now they must be regulated based on their Canadian portfolio. Yeah, so right? they would have a legal subsidiary in Canada, for instance, like an HSBC bank, right. there is HSBC Bank Canada, and right. f- certainly HSBC would be regulated in Canada within their holding, their Canadian holdings. The Canadian within holdings that for sure. Like, yeah. yeah, so like a bank like that would be regulated here. They'd be regulated in their U.S. operations, and then they'd also be regulated corporately in the, out of the U.K. and and globally on international standards. So yeah, yeah. The um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the equipment one because um, so much of our our audience is involved in some way. I p- probably ninety five percent has has equipment, equipment yeah. that is financed. Um, what uh, what is sort of what are some of the ins and outs of uh, financing? You know, like you said, trucks or heavy equipment or uh, manufacturing equipment, things like up- upgrading new uh, upgrading to new equipment, things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's traditionally there's four ways to finance equipment, mm. right? You know. Th- one way is just with your own cash from the business, right? People don't think of that as financing, but if you're using your own cash, you know, there's opportunity cost of you being able to use that elsewhere on different projects and whatnot. So financing it through your own cash. Secondly is through an operating lease. 
So an operating lease is where, you know, say it's Hitachi owns the equipment and they lease it to you on a monthly basis for, uh, you know, an, a set period of time. It might be a short-term lease where you're just renting, you know, a bobcat for six weeks for a project, or it might be for five years or three months or six years. So it's the operating lease at the time the, the lease expires, you know, there might be an option to renew or what have you, but the equipment goes back to Hitachi and Hitachi owns it and it's off your balance sheet. And, and basically as a business, you write that off as a lease every every month, right? So, so as opposed so to being a uh, depreciating asset, if it's actually... It's just a, a lease expense, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Similar to like if you buy a building, you either or if you're looking at space in a building, you rent the building, which is just rent coming off, whether it's lease or rent, however it shows up on your income statement, it's similar to equipment, right? So it's just a, it's just a lease, the end of it, mm -hmm. assets owned by... Uh, the vendor or or uh, or whatnot, and uh, and you move on to the next project or the next next piece of equipment. So that's an operating lease. Yeah. Then there's a capital lease. So a capital lease is a is a unique way of effectively buying a piece of equipment. So again, you might go to a you know a Hitachi or, or Caterpillar or whom, whomever and 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 buy a piece of equipment, and you're sitting down with them, and they they offer you whether it's themselves through their financing programs or or through a bank a capital lease. So a capital lease is it's very, I would call it almost more similar to a loan, but it does have characteristics of an operating lease from a tax perspective, and, and I'm not going to jump into that. I'm not an accountant. You know, talk to your accountant about it, whether, you know, what <laughs> option is the best, but... we got to find an interesting accountant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you should right? have an accountant and Brad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, accountants actually, uh, si they're a lot, they can be a lot of fun outside of the office, right? They, don't, <laughs> they, they still know how to have fun and, you know, drink beer. I and, actually, know, when time. we sit down with the accountants, I always really enjoy it yeah, because yeah. it's all the stuff that I'm trying to, like, they... They're very knowledgeable, right? Depends They're on your interest. Most people, yeah. it's like, but I, if I was doing it every day, then I, exactly. well, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> so, yeah, so a capital lease works more like a loan. So mm. through, it'll traditionally be, okay, the asset is $100,000, say, and you're going to sit down with the lender and, and okay, we're going to do a capital lease. You basically pay a principal and interest portion for a five-year term, say, of the loan. And at the end of it, you have a small amount. It's, you know, that amount is negotiable. It can be a dollar, it can be $100, or it can be 10% of the asset or 20% of the asset. It's kind of negotiable in the stage. But at the end, you have an amount that you pay the financer and then you own the equipment. Mm. And it's more like a loan, a traditional loan that people th people think of. The, the capital lease has certain... Um, certain tax benefits to doing it. it. It allows you to be a little more flexible with how you're writing off the asset, how you're depreciating the asset. Right. So, you know, that's a good conversation to have with your accountant. Hey, we're looking to buy a piece of equipment. Should we do an operating line sh or an operating lease? Should we do a capital lease or a loan? The third thing I'll talk, or the, the last one I'll talk to you about. So that's a capital lease. So you might have it for five years and at the end you do a hundred grand, hundred hundred dollar payment, sorry, and then you own the asset. Technically during that period, the vendor still owns the asset. Okay. So you're still leasing it. So you're 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 in effect leasing for f for holding future assets. Exactly right. So you're you're leasing it. It's like a lease to own. Yeah. Kind of. I guess you can think of it li mm -hmm. like that way. Um. So so yeah, th that's a capital uh, a capital lease. The banks like it because from a realization scenario, they own the asset already, right? They don't have to go find, they don't have to go register and discharge yours and, and take ownership. They already own the asset. Right. They just have to find it and get it back. <laughs> right. right. Uh, if it's out on a site somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, that's a capital lease. And then there's a loan. So traditionally, there's a loan. You know, you walk into a bank, most people are familiar with a loan and, you know, you own the asset. It goes on your balance sheet. You have a loan, principal and interest payment. Mm -hmm. At the end of the loan, it's paid out, right? Um, there's certain characteristics of each um, that depending on the business's situation it, it'll help us you know we'll help guide them you know with their account traditionally on what might be the best option because they all have different you know different features that are that are attractive and some features that might not be so for instance traditionally a, a capital lease they'll do higher leverage again because they own the asset right there's actually tax benefits to the bank as well mm -hmm. uh, for how that's structured uh, so traditionally they'll do higher leverage on on newer equipment for um under a capital lease, a lot of them are doing 100% financing for it for yeah. the right businesses that are cash flowing. Um, but most of the times, capital leases you're locked in. If you come, a, you know, you finish a project two years into a five-year lease, and you're sitting on some cash, and you're deciding, you know, for your balance sheet and for the business, we want to pay down this this capital lease. A lot of them have restrictions where you can't. You have mm. to just pay it out, right? Same as, you know, if you lease a building, traditionally you want to leave two years in, you you pay the rest of the payments, right? Right. So. You know, those are things to be definitely consider. Um, 
And then whereas a loan, most loans can be paid out at any time. Right. right? If, if you lock in with a bank on a five-year fixed rate loan, you know, that's different. But if you're working on a variable loan, an open demand loan against a piece of equipment, traditionally the banks will let you pay it out. There's no penalties to pay it out. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of as your cash flow permits. Um, the other thing that's, you know, maybe unique and, and attractive about a, a capital lease is that it's, it's real easy to identify that one piece of asset and for a lender to secure specifically against that piece of asset because they own it themselves, right? So they can carve it out from the business's other security package that they might have with a bank. If the right. bank has an operating line and some you know other mortgages and stuff, they might traditionally, the bank will take a, a general security agreement, a GSA over the whole business. It's easy to carve out one piece of equipment under a capital lease somewhere else. Right. So there, the bank, if they're doing that, like an actual loan for that, they're not going to, and they're not going to fund 100% of you buying that equipment, right? Traditionally, under the loan format, it's you know 65, 75, but certainly it's it's doable at 100. The the really unique thing in commercial um, that I that I love, you know, in residential, there's there's rules that are set by the government. The banks got to follow them, right? They, yeah. they are strict. Their rules. Banks have policy guidelines, not <laughs> policy rules. Policy guidelines, right? On the commercial side, so. You know, they don't like making exceptions to the ba to, to the rules, to the guidelines, but for the right business with the right cash flow, if they look at this and say this, you know, we're going to get our money back, they might do 100%, right? We, we've seen guys do 110%, 125%. And, and certainly there's different lenders along that, you know, the risk threshold that will do more and, or more and less. And obviously everyone needs to understand, you know, in residential lending, traditionally, if you can get approved, the posted best rate is what you get. Mm -hmm. It's out there. You see it. Everybody knows. Yeah. You know, I don't. I'm not up to speed on what rates are today. You know, three nine five or whatever it is. Uh, you you get it. In commercial, it's all risk based. So if you have a very simple transaction, you're likely and you have good cash flow. You're going to get the best rate compared to any uh, anyone else, whether it's you know across your industry or whatnot. If you're in a really safe recurring revenue government contract type industry, that's safer for the banks. You get a better rate than somebody that's in you know, a riskier project-based eat-what-you-kill type industry, right? Yeah. So commercial, it's all priced based on risk. So yeah. we have the ability to structure things differently, which might increase the risk for the bank, which might increase obviously the rate. But as a business owner, you make that decision. Is yeah. it worth getting more leverage to pay a little bit higher rate because we can invest it in the business and whatnot, right? Yeah. But yeah, so th th that's kind of the, the spread of how to finance equipment. The, the, the equipment marketplace is is saturated. There's a ton of lenders out there, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things that um, that we see a lot in the in the industry is businesses that a project or something comes up and they need the equipment now, mm -hmm. right? So they just go to the lender that they find the quickest, and and generally the lenders that can do it the quickest, it's because they ask the least amount of questions. They're more comfortable just securing on the asset, mm -hmm. so they're going to be a higher rate, right? Right. So you ultimately pay for it. I if a business, especially a really good business, has the ability to have the foresight that we might need this type of equipment or, you know, again, that, that budget that I talked about, you know, we've got our budget for next year. We've got these three or four contracts coming up. These are types of equipment. These are the capital expenditures we might need to make. If they come to us ahead of time and then we go to a primary lender, we can often get a lot of that pre-approved. Mm -hmm. So we can get an equipment purchasing line pre-approved that says, you know, over the next 12 months, here's $8 million that mm -hmm. you have available that's pre-approved subject to you producing invoicing and, and at the time being within your covenants to just go do it. So that process to get that line initially takes some time and it's a, it's a pretty overwhelming process um, that, that we'd be happy to help anyone out with. But at the time of funding, the project might come and you might need the money or a machine breaks down, you need a new one quick they can fund really quick. Just Sometimes so long as you can provide paperwork that you are going to, in fact, purchase this yeah. equipment. Yeah, and a lot of the times they'll fund it directly to the vendor. Yeah. Right? So you don't even have to, you know, you kind of kind of get out of it, right? So preparation and, and all of that. But but certainly, you know, there's a large amount of, you know, finance lenders out there that are that just finance equipment and they can do it quick. And, and they're, they're going to be more and more expensive because they're doing less due diligence than oh, uh, you have to adjust the, uh, the mic. <laughs> you can uh, you can put them the there them go. high is that better yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. good. <laughs> um so yeah um actually something that came to my mind was uh in you said uh, commercial versus residential um is it still there's more there's uh they have policy 
or guidelines as opposed to government policy. Uh, but it, it kind of goes without saying, but it's always still, it's always prime plus still, right? You're always dealing, you're always starting from that prime. Uh, really Gen good businesses are uh, can be boring below prime right now. Yeah, really? For sure, yeah. It's uh, Everything is risk-based, right? The, the one thing that, you know, is, is again unique to commercial versus you know personal lending. Personal, you go get a mortgage, you sign up, they give you a 25-year mortgage, you're committed for the, the bank's committed for 25 years. You don't ever have to requalify as long as you don't miss a payment, you don't breach any of their you know default in any way. Mm -hmm. You've got the mortgage and you've got the house for 25 years. Business in business finance, they look at it almost every year, right? Some mm -hmm. lenders will commit for f the period of the loan, three years, five years, whatever, but most lenders are renewing all your facilities every year. So if you have a really good year, it's improved your balance sheet, you retain a bunch of earnings, your risk for the bank, the risk of default is ultimately what the bank cares about, goes way down, you can get unbelievably low rates. Mm. It, it might the next year if you have a not so hot year and it, you know, the risk goes up, your rates might go up I again. See. But but for sure we've done loans many under prime, right? Um, oh. you know, again, it's a good operating business with really good cash flow. Um it happens, right? It's not. It's not everyone. I don't want everyone calling me like, "Oh, we want under prime." <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm talking about, you know, you heard it here first, people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I am talking about the the cream of the crop in the industry, healthy balance sheets and yeah. whatnot, right? One of the other things that's unique, uh, just kind of sp spurred my uh, the thought here, because if you are a business that a lot of businesses don't realize it, but businesses are also lenders, right? Mm -hmm. When you every business, most businesses, when you invoice someone and you give them 30 days to pay you or 60 days or 90 days to pay you, you, you've earned the money today, you're realizing it on your income statement, it is your money, you're lending them essentially the, the invoice for the next 30, 60, 90 days. Mm -hmm. And a lot of business, you know, out there, I'm sure most most people, you know, in, in industry are, are listening, they know they can, you can pay a premium to get paid early or you can, on the other side, you know, have a customer pay you a premium to give them more time, right? So a lot of the times we've we've ran into unique scenarios where our business is finance. We do finance, right? Um, and we meet a business and they go, oh, "No, we don't borrow." You know, we've been in industry; we're not borrowing at all. And we go, "Well, are you, you can borrow, like just so you know, like you're the tier one client. You're going to be bro borrowing around prime. A lot of your customers, suppliers, I'm telling you, most likely aren't. Mm. So what kind of terms are you offering your your customers, right? And it, oh, we we get paid in net thirty. It's like, well, would you be comfortable maybe giving them 60 or 90? That would mean potentially that as a business, you have to borrow in order to give you those terms, but you're borrowing at three. And if you're charging a premium of 2% to give somebody 60 days, you know, you're annualizing that out, you know, and all of a sudden it's 12%, right? So yeah. there, there's other ways for, for businesses to use the banks to, to improve their ultimate bottom line, right? right? Yeah. And and to improve their their customers, yeah, give their customers well. give their customers more time to pay. And a lot of the times, you know, borrowing is not bad. You know, you, you obviously as a business owner need to manage your collections and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and there's there's financial products out there to help manage that. You know, albeit like you know credit insurance and you know that kind of thing. Um, so you have to manage that process. But if you are managing it efficiently and and you know you've got a good business on the other side and Ultimately, again, think of it as a business owner. You are lending your customer money for 30, 60, 90 days. Mm -hmm. So if they're asking for those terms and you're going to give them a limit that you're willing to be exposed to them, collect their financial statements. Collect the necessary information, the same information that the bank's asking you for. Collect it from them and make kind of do your own due diligence, right? right? And if you see they're a really healthy company and they're only boring because they've got, they're growing like crazy or whatnot, you know, maybe it is worth, you know, extending your terms and, and, and collecting some some form of premium up front and for offsetting so. that what you're paying to the towards yeah. the bank. What do you think is um two part question of what's a misconception people have and I you probably covered it with uh like people well what's a misconception people have and what mistakes are they commonly making? Is it do you how big of a, a tripping point is it that people not telling the whole story is that one of the big mistakes people make or, or what yeah, do you that, think a big th mistake is that, that could be i mean it, it depends what we're talking about um like if it's a big mistake in terms of not getting approved mm -hmm. you know th there's nothing worse that the banks ultimately are your partner right they're a supplier of yours right, right. I, I always laughed that i got called by a customer back when i worked for the bank and they said hey we're doing a, a supplier's turn golf tournament for all of our suppliers you know Will the bank f sponsor us? And I said, well, 
did I, how come I didn't get an invite to play? Well, you're not a supplier. And I was like, we supply you with $10 million <laughs> of cash every year. Like we're one of your major suppliers. That? Come on. Right. <laughs> so the, the banks are, you know, the, 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 the banks are your partner. They want to work with you. Right. Ultimately they're not in it for one transaction. They want to build a relationship too. And, and, you know, as much as I talked about balance sheet and income statement, something else that's so, so important is just management, right? And if you've got management that's up front, even if it's something that bad happens, bad things happen. Banks have bad quarters. Banks lose money. Banks, get, you know, do fraud. Banks do, you know, bad things on the one-off too. Bad, it's bad stuff just happens. The economy moves and changes and rolls, right? So if, if there's something that's bad if, and you're fully on transparent about it and you demonstrate your understanding of why that happened and why what you've done to show that it's not going to happen certainly right mm -hmm. people are i think one of the biggest kind of misconceptions of people kind of they tend to you know when i was a banker people put bankers on pedestals and you know bankers are extremely intelligent and you know and educated and you know they certainly know what they're doing you know, in all aspects but a lot of the times they're just real people that just they understand your problems and want to help you right and, and you know the misconception of oh, the bank's going to turn me down if I don't know that, so I better not tell you. know That certainly is, right? But the other the other kind of big misconception is that uh, you can negotiate financing. Mm -hmm. uh, I find, um, you know, I think, oh, that's just table stakes. I worked in the bank. Some customers negotiate, some don't. But right. that was a big part of why I started the business in the first place is that I sat, you know, behind a desk and, you know, I'd, I'd put out a, a good offer for a client, but I I would be thinking, oh, are they going to ask, you know, for better? And, and the bank, the bank's obviously in the interest of making as much money and as possible. And are they going to shop around once I give the offer? Yeah, right. Yeah. So the bank's obviously in the interest of making money. Like everyone out there, every business, I don't think it would be a secret that you're trying to get as much margin as you possibly can, like in a fair manner. So you're putting out a good fair offer, but, you know, the bank on the backside knows that they could thin it up a little bit here or cut this fee a little bit here. And, and the misconception, I think, in the industry sometimes is that, they don't know you can do that, right? And, and part of it, you know, there we have some customers that we put out our best offer. You know, when I was back in the bank, I'd put out my best offer, and they'd still negotiate. And you, you know, are you nuts, right? Like, you know, it's not that way. So being able to identify when there is some room in there, so so that's a big part of what we do is we risk. Uh, we basically we call it spreading, but we risk rate the clients ourselves to get a good understanding of where they should be, what rates they should be paying, and we've obviously got data. And access to all you know a ton of other customers you know within our firm that we're dealing with, so we kind of know well this customer got this rate, so it's about kind of the same risk threshold, similar type industry. You should be able to get it. So when we get that offer from the bank, we go, oh no, this is, you know, we can do better than this. You know, this right. is a good start, but we can do better, right? So that that's a misconception sometimes, and, and and you you don't, I mean, in any industry, you don't want to be the guy grinding for every penny because every business needs to make money to survive, right? Right. Um, and every business deserves the right if you're in a business and. And you're providing value. You deserve to make money for sure, right? So yeah. you don't want to be scraping, you know, every coin off. And, and you, there's that balance of you don't want to, you know, piss off or irritate the lender where they, you know, they don't want to work with you anymore. But but certainly there's that uh, that 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 I found is a, a, you know, when we've presented a term sheet to to a client and we said, okay, well, we're going to scratch that out and we're going to try for this rate, and they've said, you can do that, like really? So that would be one. Yeah. Misconception, yeah. Now, I'm curious. Uh, when you worked for the bank, did you ever come across anyone who may who wasn't uh, uh, what's it called uh, trying to get a better rate, and and you were like, oh, maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I mean, that that was most honestly, most bankers really do care a lot about their customers. Um, I cared tremendously. I I, f I always felt I ultimately worked for the bank. That was one of the toughest things. Is that the bank paid my paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. I ultimately worked for the bank, but I was probably on as far of the customer side as you'd see, and that was a big reason that I, I started the business. Is I always wanted to fight for customers. I always, I always looked at it like, listen, if we could give a better rate or a better deal, and make sure that they're aware that they are getting the best deal, and they can go shop around and confirm that, then that's a hundred times better than us giving them a pretty good deal, and then them shopping around and then coming back and being like, well, why would? This bank, who doesn't even deal with it, why would they give us a better deal, right? Yeah. Right. So yeah. certainly, like there, there were, there were, there were, there are definitely positions, and and like any other business, where you know you kind of have that feeling, like oh, I could probably give this guy a better deal, but I, you know, but the guy behind you know, the, you is the, <laughs> yeah. the models in the bank, and you know, kind of everything else. Um, but yeah, certain certainly that that would happen. Yeah. You must have found, and I guess in, with that type of thinking, though, which is we'll, we'll get into a little bit of why you you started Ashdown, which you already touched on, is when you're when you're just the banker working for the bank, 
you really your limited option is half a percent either way. Really, you right. don't you can't you can't phone the bank next door and say or and say. negotiate, right? And is that so? Is that sort of what uh, you you already did touch on it? But can you just kind of when you what made you actually decide to make that the leap to yeah. go completely so, out on your own? I mean, I've always been entrepreneurial. My parents own a own a business, and, and I've always been intrigued in you know what they're doing, and you know I've always I've always been driven that way and, and interested in that. Um, and I always knew, you know, I thought when I was going to go to university, I was going to graduate, I'd have a job for one or two years, and start up my company, and you know, kind of explode out of it. That was always my vision. Um, so I always kind of knew that that would be the steer to take the leap, but. In terms of you know the why and why I started you know this business in, in particular, a big part of it was I know that now I work 100% for the interests of my client. You know we have a an agreement, a contract. What you know we're going to be paid to do this from that moment on. We work for you, right? We work for the business. So mm -hmm. that was a big part of it. Um, the other thing was I had a ton of. I've always been really. I love going out and speaking with people. I, I love going to businesses. I love that. That's what I love. I didn't. I didn't like sitting behind a desk and crunch numbers and, and writing a deal like you know, like I, I had to do a lot at the bank. So I loved being out and I was really good at, at honestly just developing networks and, and bringing in business. But a lot of the business that would come in, it, it didn't fit the mold of the bank, right? It wasn't, you know, whether it was they weren't super keen on that industry right now or they were over their cap for, you know, in real estate like we talked about or it just wasn't the right type of business or it wasn't the right size of business or, or what have you, where we would have to turn it away and I'd refer it to another bank somewhere where I had absolutely no control over. So being able to get out on my own where I was working for a business mm -hmm. and the actual funder that I was going to, my motive and my job was to go find the absolute best funder for that business at that very mo at that very moment, right? And, you know, I'd, I'd because I was a very, um, I was always networking and out, and out in the community and, you know, marketing and whatnot, I already had a really good, uh, like base of other bankers at different banks that I was sending deals back and forth when we couldn't do them and that kind of thing that I'd built up really good uh, relationships with. So it was kind of a, na a natural fit. And, and I, and I also just saw a hole in the market. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a lot of, um, there's a lot of residential mortgage brokers out there and, and there's, you know, they are phenomenal. And, and there's a lot of commercial mortgage brokers out there um, that, that specialize purely in whether it's developing towers or single family construction homes mm -hmm. or the odd investor building investor owned real estate building but that was that was kind of the, that was kind of it you know in, in the years that I was in the bank in commercial banking you know almost eight years uh, I never once had a deal come to me from a a, a loan broker a mortgage broker or a commercial mortgage broker that that was a working capital facility where we were trying to help a business grow and try to you know take on you know a new project or something like that it was all it's all they're all kind of geared towards real estate where right I love doing real estate, and, and, and fr frankly, my partner does most of the uh, the real estate stuff. I, I myself do more of the working capital um, uh, acquisitions and equipment, that kind of stuff. Um, so I love doing that stuff, and there was no one doing it. And I, I, I was fortunate that I had a handful of customers that I built a really good relationship with that I was able to kind of survey them. Hey, is this a service that someone would pay for? And then I, I, again, thankfully had a good enough relationship with you know different banks and this and that, and is this a service that you'd be interested in me bringing you? If I brought you, you know, a new client that was really, you know, growing and their existing bank wasn't understanding their story or, or that, you know, they weren't happy with it or they just needed more money or the, you know, what have you, would you be interested in taking on these files? And of course they said yes, right? So mm -hmm. there were, there were a, a, a number of motivating factors. Um, I love the ability to, you know, be on, be on my own, be entrepreneurial and grow a business and, you know, shift with the market and kind of mm -hmm. do things as we as we see fit and not having you know a corporate make decisions for me effectively but yeah. um yeah th those would be kind of the primary reasons yeah i we've known each other a few years now um you know and you, you've worked with us a bit and i it's it's very clear that you have the uh the ability to make make partnerships that you've taken on more partners uh in ashdown capital um what is it for you that where did you learn that from to is it is, is it something for you that's natural or is it something that you learned did did you get tips i actually remember you you uh, mentioning a, a gentleman that uh said uh like he always takes a meeting you know and uh, you've sort of taken on that 
is that is it sort of a natural ability to to develop those partnerships and relationships? How much of it is developed or, yeah. or mentored? So, I mean, my mom said my mom has always told me that you know I have two brothers and we'd go to the grocery store and she'd lose me all of a sudden she'd find me and I'd be standing there talking having <laughs> conversation with strangers. Um, I was always out talking. I, I've always enjoyed talking to people. Uh, th- that's something I've you know, call it being good at and, or, or what have you. It's a natural skill set, I guess. I, I, and I truly do enjoy that. Right. So building that that network, you know, that came naturally. That, that I enjoy doing those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, that that was easy. In, in terms of the, the you know, the, the meeting uh, thing you said there, yeah, I had a, a, a mentor of mine that had told me uh, a long time ago that he never says no to a meeting. And I'm this is a guy running a, a massive company and, like, unbelievably successful and, and I can testify to him that he doesn't because I've met students and I've met, you know, people starting out and people that are starting out a business to compete in his industry. And they've asked me, oh, you know, and I've introduced and, and he's gone for those breakfast meetings or coffee meetings or what have you with anyone that I've ever put in front of him. Mm-hmm. Um, so he told me, you know, years and years ago, don't say no to a meeting because you just you really never know who you're going to meet and what opportunities are going to come by that. And the opportunity could be honestly teaching a student something that changes their life or or somebody that knows their uncle's owns this and does this that might be a customer. You, you just never know. I mean, you can, you have to be obviously cautious of how you spend your time. And yeah. and he warned me of that right off the top. But he said, yeah, if somebody reaches out to him, he, he might look at his calendar and say, you know what, it's we're towards the end of February right now. Uh, you know, want to go for a coffee meeting. You know, how does the second of June sound, because that'll work for me, right? It might be three, four months ahead, but never say no to a meeting. And honestly, that has paid beyond dividends for me mm-hmm. over the years. Um, you know, people I've met, I've sat across from people that, you know, maybe aren't as naturally uh, av- av- able to just com- converse and, you know, have those conversations and stuff. And they come across as someone like, oh, your first impression, this guy might, you know, be, might be wasting our time or something like that. But it, it, it never turns out that way. There's always value in a conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, everybody used to say, oh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And it, it's, that's so cliche, but it's so true, right? Mm-hmm. You just, opportunities come from, from people, right, I, in yeah. general, right, from your network. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> it, rambling again. It very mu- no, it, it's exactly <laughs> answered my question. Um, like you talked about partners. Yeah, well, that that's the other thing. Yeah, yeah so... Like our only equity partner, myself and, and Ryan, um, and but we've got we develop relationships and we consider them partners. Everyone that we've brought onto our team, our goal we want to bring on guys onto our team that ultimately want to be partner. Like a law firm, you know, a lawyer wants to work to become partner. Mm-hmm. You know, we want that same mindset, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we truly do believe in passing on success and, and building something as a group. You cannot like there's, you know, I was listening to I remember what a podcast the other day and. It, remember who was on it, but he said the only thing that we all have equal is we all have 24 hours in a day, mm-hmm. right? People are given different opportunities and, and everything else, but everyone has 24 hours in a day, right? right. And you choose how you want to spend that time, right? So we only, ha- I only have so much time in the day and, you know, and I'd, I'd love to personally be able to help every business out there, but there's only so much time in the day. So we found awesome people and, and we're really selective in the people that we bring into our firm that are just as experienced and just as capable and, and, and have as much drive and, and enjoyment for the business and the process to bring them on as, as honestly, they are all partners already in our business, not equity partners, you know, you know, yet, but, but certainly that's down the road. And then in terms of partnerships with other businesses, Mm -hmm. like we have partnerships effectively, like not non-equity, but partnerships with uh, any customer we have, like, in the end, if I do a really good job for a customer, the best thing they could possibly do for me is refer th- refer me to a supplier or a customer or what have you, right? So we're always cautious in developing partnerships like that. We have a, a couple um, couple partners, you know, partnerships, businesses that we do ad hoc, right? We help them with financing and they maybe s- supply us with some, you know, marketing or some entertainment stuff or, or whatever, right? right. Um, you know, d- different types of products or, or whatever, right? Um, so partnerships and partners are, you know, they're, they're pivotal in any business, especially as you grow, right? And and I would say, you know, one of the one of the things that I think a lot of business owners appreciate, but but maybe some people should think more of, is like the partnership with you and your bank is is so important, right? And mm-hmm. and we've, you know, back to another reason I started the, the business is that we think of ourselves as we're your banking partner, right? You're we're, you know, my, my partner's coined the chief banking officer. We're not a CFO. We're not a CEO. 
but think of us as like a chief banking officer. If you have anything banking related, you come to us and, and, and we'll do you it. You just created a job for someone. They just went, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? <laughs> but yeah, Going to their uh, boss now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a new thing that everybody's doing. But it, but the fact of the matter yeah. is, like, finance doesn't is for a business, doesn't matter how, be, you're not doing it 20, like, all day, all year, right? right. It, it, we get really busy with a customer for a three-month period and then, yeah. we, you know, we might go for a coffee or, or a drink or something, a lunch or whatever, you know, on a quarterly basis or whatever. And, and if you are doing it every day of the year, you're probably not uh, doing very well. Then you're not doing a, a yeah. As, uh, you know, yeah, you're not doing a, a good <laughs> job, right? So the partnership with the banks and like that—that's our job, you know. And it's 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 a one of the common concerns we get from customers is, oh, like we've had five account managers at our bank in the last five years. They seem to turn over like mm. you know all the time, yeah. right? And that could be a huge disruption to your business. You, you know, you have a gentleman out right, or a woman yeah. out that comes out and you views your business and checks out the site and learns about your business and learns about the goods and the bad and everything, yeah. and then they leave and then you have to retrain somebody else and teach them. So yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. so we like we look at it as a lot of the times because we're so connected to the banks. You know, we've got great partnerships with the banks that we know ahead of time a lot of the time if somebody's moving from one bank to the other or they're going into industry or, right. or getting promoted out of and that you have position options or whatever, if right? someone else swaps out you have another bank that you can so we can talk to their manager or whatever and say hey listen we think this company would be a really good yeah. fit you know we know john smith is leaving but we think they'd be a really good fit for you know claudia or whatever right yeah. so yeah it's uh, partnerships are huge and uh, and honestly uh, i think something that yeah is overlooked is the partnership that businesses have with their bank yeah. uh, the we do some we do some consulting in that in in our in our business and uh, even yesterday I was on the phone with with a client and I, I it you know it was a good conversation but it got to the point where I had to in effect say to him I I know this isn't what you want to hear but I'm getting paid to give you the right answer that's why people yeah. continue to pay so how do you how do you find that balance? Because especially when you're talking about, you know, business owners, executives, especially if they're founders, they've built this company up over 20 years and now they're trying to expand or they're trying to get things all in order and, you know, that, those kind of things. How do you find that balance? Because I'm sure you, it, it gets there, they're amped up because it's so close to home. It's yeah. everything they've built. How do you find that balance in kind of guiding them through but also giving them the truth, even if it's because yeah. I'm sure you have to give a lot of bad news oh, sure. in this business. Yeah, no, the, the that's the hardest part of our job mm -hmm. by far, right? Back when I was in the bank, and now what we do now is is the no, right? It's the the straight hard truth. But you know, we talk to the bankers, and we say a quick no, time is everything. A quick no is better than a really drawn out long no, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that can be tough. I mean, we always, you know, thankfully we don't see. Pardon me, we don't see a ton of businesses where the answer is, no, you can't get finance this, and you should shut down your business because it's not viable right. and blah, blah, blah. It, it's, a lot it's, of the times it's, it's... yes, but it's going to cost you this, this, this. That, that maybe, but a lot a lot of the times it's, you know, we're not a no then. We're just like, listen, this bank said no, that's where we're going to have to go to a second tier lender that's looking at it differently and pay a higher rate or whatever. But the no could be, sometimes it's no... But you might have to think about an equity partner, right? Bringing mm. on somebody that's going to inject some cash into your business, or it might be no. But if you need you need to clean up this, like cut your expenses in this area, do this, do that, kind of provide some guidance there. Like we're n we're ultimately we're not you know, long term consultants. There's you know tons of different groups out there that can do a fantastic coaching jobs and right. with that. But w it, it might be no, not right now, and the reason is because of this. But if you're able to fix this, or if you change your leverage this, or if you find a partner that's willing to do this, or if you buy a smaller building, or you buy a used piece of equipment, or you, you know, we always try to help and find something, yeah. some solution. Because I hate the no, right? That's the hardest part of the job. It really yeah. is. Like, you know, and especially like you said, if there is a, a business owner on the other uh, other side that, you know, is geared in and, and believes in. It. And the hard part is that because like banks. Banks are in the business, obviously, to make money, right? Mm -hmm. And what a lot of people don't realize about banks, you know, we'll, we'll come back and say, hey, here's a no. You know, we, we can't do this. The bank said no or the lender said no. And they, they kind of up arm up in arms. Well, why does a bank say no? And, and we say, well, it's just a little too risky. It just doesn't fit their appetite. And, and when we break it down, sometimes it's good for people on the outside to think about it this way that, you know, if a bank is lending you money at, call it 5%, right? And... It's a one of the bigger banks, a BMO or RBC or somebody like that. They're lending you a five percent. They are buying that money on the open market, whether right. they're paying for it in GICs and deposits that they've got, paying to consumers, 
or they're buying it through the bond markets and, and equity markets. So they're paying for that money. You know, for simplicity, call it three percent. They're paying, and then they're going to loan it out at five percent. So their gross margin is two percent, mm. right? Gross margin, right? How many businesses operate at gross margin at two percent? Gross right. margin. They then pay for brick and mortar. They pay for salaries. They pay bonuses. They pay for everything else. And then ultimately, they lend that money out, and there's still a chance they don't get it back, that they just lose it, right? And while the banks do a tremendous job, and they have to, in mitigating risk to keep their risk, their losses as low as possible, um, th it still happens, right? They can have losses. You know, if they lose a, if they lose a, a million dollar deal, you know, and and they're only doing it at two percent margins, they got to do fifty million, just to, just to cover it, right? Like, you know, it's it's. So that can be tough, but help, helping businesses understand that, you know, and I pose it back to them, like, w if you knew your spread, if you, would you lend this to your cousin or brother-in-law or your customer for the exact same deal, knowing that your spread is 2%? Mm -hmm. And most of them go, heck no, <laughs> right? No way I would, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's not all cases, but th that's kind of a different way to think about it at least. Um, but, but yeah, the no, the no is tough. Um, but it's really rare that it's a no sorry, we can't help you and no one can. Right. It, it's usually, uh, you know, no, we can't do this, uh, you know, talk to these people or, or do that, right? right? I mean, we get a lot of financing requests just by nature, you know, for startup financing and, and smaller businesses. And, 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 you know, and we s not that we specialize, we help a lot of small businesses. We're, we're, we're good at that and we enjoy doing that too. But where we really add value is, is to that medium to larger size business. Cash that, flow, assets. You know, where, the, you where know. it's a true business loan because yeah. typically... The smaller loans, you know, we touched on it briefly before. The, the smaller loans are adjudicated more on a personal side. Yeah. The shareholder matter matters more than everything. The credit score matters. If it's if it's in that like three to five hundred thousand dollar range, you know, you might be putting up equity in your house or something like that. If you don't have the the commercial business assets right. and the track record and stuff, yeah. it it ends up being more of a personal loan. And we do specialize. We're commercial lenders. Right? We, we we work in commercial, so that, you know we're our, we're geared more towards you know larger businesses. But we get a ton of calls and and inquiries from smaller businesses, and we love helping them out. You know whether it's just by referring them to the right partner at a bank that will be able to help them, or the right mm -hmm. personal person that would be able to do it, or the right you know government sponsored program, or you know right. something like that. Right? Yeah. What's the uh, well you know before we wrap up the show? What's sort of your vision for Ashdown? 10, 10 years from now <laughs> or two. I mean, like you said, the, 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 you're working in this business. Uh, you know, you're not working for a corporate organization anymore. So it can change. Yeah. But what is sort of, what would what would you like to see happen with a company like Ashton? Yeah, no, I mean, th the exact ten, 10 years is, oh man. That's, that uh, six like months. Forever away. <laughs> six <yeah>. months. <laughs> <laughs> six months. I mean, for us, like we're growing like crazy right now. Um, like I said, we've brought on a, a few different uh, a few different people into our our organization. We've expanded to the island. You know, we're as, as far out now as Chilliwack and Hope. So we mm -hmm. we kind of cover the greater Vancouver area. We the model we've built, and we've got such good feedback from business owners in the value that we're providing. Um, and people are financing business all over the all over the country, all over Western Canada, all over the world for that matter. Um, so we do have the vision of expanding. You know, maybe next into the interior and 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 further out into BC and then through Alberta and you know potentially event across Canada. Um, you know, we're we're a, we're we're a business ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, with growth comes you know capital requirements and extra time and, and everything else. I've got a young kid at home, so you know, I, I I'm it's, it's extremely important for me to carve out you know time for that too. So it's uh, we 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 definitely think we're going to continue growing. Mm -hmm. um, but to say where we'll be in ten years, uh, you know, I don't know. I'll still be here. I'm, I'm thinking. I don't, the business will, will certainly will, will keep expanding. But yeah. Um, well, it, it seems uh, from seeing you work and, and just seeing some of the people that you're, you're interacting with, I, I, I can't see it doing anything at but growing. But uh, thank you, Brad, for yeah, coming no, on the show. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me on. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Okay, thank you for uh, joining. I hope. Uh, Wrong camera. This one. <laughs> <laughs> I told I knew I knew as soon as <laughs> you told me happen. to switch cameras, <laughs> I knew there's no way. There's no way I'm gonna remember. This is <laughs> this is like for pure TV now. I'm having to look <laughs> over different directions. Which one are we looking at? Um thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining the show, everybody. Um finance is such a huge part of uh operating any of the businesses we talk about. Um hopefully we're doing this show in ten years and finance will always be 
a key factor. So keep watching the show um, and, you know, uh, send questions. We'll put some information how to get in touch with Ashdown Capital, um, nice. you know, if, if you, you have something that you're looking to get financed. And... Uh, Gowdy, take it away with our with how people can get in <laughs> touch with us and follow yeah. us and like us and subscribe. Subscribe to YouTube, uh, Crownsman Partners. Uh, we are filming an episode a week every Friday. So we are. It's intense. Um, I think we're going to be very tired. And but booked for two months. Guests yes. just keep on. So subscribe. Yeah. Don't miss a single episode. Also on Anchor, if you just want to listen to it, uh, we're on Anchor. Again, Crownsman Partners, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. You pretty all much got Crownsman us up P. on every platform. Every single thing. Sorry, I'm sure there's probably one I've missed. Yeah, but it's <laughs> most of it's at Crownsman P. Yes, is that, all is our that social th- media is at Crownsman P. And then if they, on those podcast platforms, it makes they basically just look just up Crownsman yeah, Partners. Yeah, just look up Crownsman Podcast, um, and we'll show up. Okay. Yeah. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>